Hi there, and thanks for joining us for this webinar on identifying comprehensive science curriculum. My name is Francis Vigent. I'm a former teacher and CEO here at NoAdam. It's also a co-founder of the company about uh, 10 years ago. And what we hope to do today during this webinar is not only to talk about identifying comprehensive science curriculum, but to unpack that process, uh, thinking about how to differentiate between curriculum and standards to begin with. Next, taking a look at this next generation classroom science experience that comes out of these three-dimensional standards and how we move from the many different supplements uh, and sort of disparate resources that, that many of us see, you know, kind of inheriting from prior programs um, as new teachers or things that we've accumulated over time that may not be aligned. Uh, you know, how do we get from that to some comprehensive uh, science curriculum. Last bit that we'll take a look at is uh, a guided tour of NGSS aligned STEM tasks and curriculum. Um, the focus is going to be K-12 uh, with a special focus really on elementary and middle school because uh, this is where some of the greatest shifts are occurring uh, in terms of you know how what resources are going to be um, able to be aligned even versus those that uh, may exist at, at the upper grade levels with labs perhaps already in place. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to jump right in here and how to differentiate between curriculum and standards. If you're on the live session, I just want to let you know, feel free to ask questions throughout. I'll do my best to incorporate those in our presentation here. And we also have uh, some curriculum specialists that are going to be um, helping to uh, vet some questions and respond if you have something that's very situation specific as well um, and they'll be on the live session. If You'll be able to enter those questions just by going to the questions panel on your screen, typing those questions in and then uh, going right ahead and uh, sending those over. If you're not on the live session, all you have to do is reach out to us through our contact us on the on the top of um, our website and we'll do our best to respond to those uh, personally. So with that said, let's jump in and really think about you know, what are those next generation science standards. These new standards are performance expectations. The two words are in essence synonymous, but the difference here is that students, it's what students are going to be expected to, proof, to perform as a result of classroom instruction. So standards really, whether you call them performance expectations or standards, define the, min the minimum performance expectations of a student who has understanding, who has mastered that performance expectation or that standard. Mastery means that a student is operating at a level that they can apply those, that knowledge, those skills, and so on in many different contexts and are able to connect them with other standards. That requires an understanding of the science and engineering practices, also the cross-cutting concepts, and the disciplinary core ideas. And so when you look at the construction of the standards themselves, that's why you see a performance expectation supported by these three foundations, the science and engineering practices, the disciplinary core ideas, and the cross-cutting concepts. That Those are the three dimensions of every single standard, and every standard or performance expectation is connected to other performance expectations. And so when we think about the standards, um, they're three-dimensional, and they have this sort of dynamic relationship to each other, and those three foundation boxes are also dynamically connected as well. So I'm not going to go into this too much further, except to say that the standards themselves are expectations of student performance. It's sort of a, a level, a minimum expectation of where a student should be able to perform, but they are not tasks. So if you just click, if I click back over to this standard, developing a model to describe the movement of matter among plants, animals, decomposers, and the environment might sound to people like a task, but in fact it's a, it's a, it's an expectation that a student could look at an infinite number of situations and be able to demonstrate that they can develop a model 
from that context, whether it's a picture of the Arctic tundra, what's happening outside the window of your classroom right now, uh, a marine ecosystem, a fish tank, any of these sort of things, could be a potential context that we could use to challenge your student, and your student should be able to develop a model to describe the movement of matter among plants, animals, decomposers, and the environment. Not a specific task of, you know, one um, diagram or one picture or whatever, okay? So thinking about skills as something and, and standards as something that are general. Now, one of the issues here is that we're bringing this back to comprehensive science curriculum, is that many of the kind of bits and parts of resources that are probably um, like the resources that I inherited when I became a teacher in your closet from many different programs or things that have been downloaded offline or whatever, um, you know, fragments of kits, is that they are designed around a traditional model of science instruction, this idea that content flows through the teacher and that the teacher models those facts, demonstrates the phenomena, and explains what things are, are, what the facts are. The problem with this model is that where, what is the definition of proficiency for that student? It's simply being able to recall what was explained, being able to repeat the demonstrations that were shown, and being able to summarize the phenomena and facts that were shown or explained. And so it's very much built on rote recall, and, it's, and this is what the old models of uh, state level assessments for science and engineering, whether you're looking at elementary level, middle school, or high school level, this is what they were built around, and this is what many folks were taught to teach. And so when you think about textbooks, when you think about kits, when you think about downloaded resources from museums or from uh, teacher to teacher websites or whatever, many of them have been shaped by what everybody has been taught to teach in this traditional model. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, again, a traditional model may have physical components. It may be hands-on, but it's not necessarily teaching skills. And that's the key point I want to point out here, is that recalling, repeating, and summarizing does not have a skills basis to it. Its basis is historical fact content. And jumping back to this diagram, the um, science and engineering practices dimension of whether we're talking about kindergarten or 12th grade is always talking about skills. And the content is not the old kind of fact content, you know, that sedimentary rocks are made of layers of sediment or, you know, comprised of layers of sediment. They're very much thinking about how content is, related, is um, interrelated. And so here you'll see things how ecosystems are made up of uh, plants and animals and how they're interrelated and form sort of um, they you know form a relationship with their environment and they they feed each other in different ways okay that's not the kind of understanding that comes out of a traditional model because the traditional model is built around I give you something and you give me something back and if the two match then you know that's proficiency and that's an A or that's a four and we move on and it's sort of going through the standards, checking them off one at a time. Next generation science standards are really focused on these higher order thinking skills. And so if you picture Bloom's taxonomy, it's kind of been rearranged. And so when you think about comprehensive science curriculum, it can't only be, you know, it can't be aimed at that traditional model of rote instruction and, and handing out facts and having students hand facts back to you because of that science and engineering practices dimension of the new standards. Um, those practices, those skills, are aimed at the higher order thinking skills from Bloom's taxonomy, creating, evaluating, and analyzing. And so when you look at this diagram, we've rearranged it to show creating, evaluating, analyzing happening simultaneously, basically being on the same level. So that, you know, students are if you picture students as scientists and engineers in the classroom, which is really what the next generation science standards uh, are communicating, then by being in the role of scientist and engineer, what scientists and engineers 
are, are people who create, evaluate, and analyze in order to answer questions or solve problems. So those lower order thinking skills of remembering, understanding, and applying just aren't sufficient. How you get from um, standards to curriculum starts really with how you picture this inquiry environment. And so transitioning the resources is also and, and getting a, co a cohesive program and a comprehensive program in place, whether you make it yourself or you buy it from somebody else or whatever, has to do with shifting from that traditional model to what we call a next generation model of inquiry instruction. And that's what I'm showing you here on the screen. It's that model where teachers are playing the role of coaches, very skillful, thoughtful coaches. And they're helping students develop science and engineering practices those skills specific to science and engineering that we were just talking about in the standards, helping them understand what the expectations are of those skills, what they look like, and they're coaching them to develop those skills. And, and by doing so, they're gradually adjusting supports, they're helping the students understand how to engage appropriately, and they're redirecting and monitoring not only individual students, but that entire instructional environment. On the flip side, what you see here kind of next is that the students are developing those skills in the context of the content and in the, in the cross-cutting concepts, those disciplinary core ideas and those cross-cutting concepts. And so students are accessing the content and developing and using it with the skills. And so that's how, again, the teacher is strengthening the relationship between the students with the skills and the content, not getting in between it. Okay, so the expectations of the students now change. It's not that you're going to give me back what I've given you, but instead the expectation is, and the resources need to support students actually developing and using the content in order to solve problems and answer questions the way that scientists and engineers do. And to use those cross-cutting concepts, which are the systems behavior, uh, to be able to describe and connect the content between disciplines and between different standards. And so that's where the classroom really changes in a big way between the former standards and these new standards. And that's where taking the existing resources you have and trying to knit them together in a new way or identifying new resources um, has to really serve a, a very specific purpose, which is what you see here. You know, you can't expect a fish you know, to fly unless it's a flying fish. And so if your resources aren't designed that way, um, then you need to think about whether, <laughs> whether they're actually useful uh, at the end of the day or you're trying to, you know, reinvent the wheel here in some respects. Uh, because, you know, um, as we go into this, you're going to see that, you know, next generation science curriculum you know, the curriculum is the context where students develop and use multiple standards in three dimensions. It's actually the path, it, the, the curriculum creates a path to mastery for students, okay? And it's mastery of the standards and of those three dimensions, the skills, the content, and the cross-cutting concepts, okay? So curriculum is not a once and done cover the standards approach where you do something in one grade level and leave it behind, or you do something in one unit and leave it behind. It's actually a system of instruction. And it's a, a system that nurtures from September through June, but also from one grade level to the next. So it's part of a continuum. It helps define what a classroom teaches by thoughtfully scaffolding the context for performance. And, and what I mean by defining what a teacher teaches doesn't mean that it removes teacher creativity and that teachers are reading off of a script. In fact, if that's what teachers are doing, that's, that's a warning sign. Because as you can imagine, this type of environment is dynamic, right? It involves Socratic dialogue. It's pulling, it's, it's, it's a you do, we think model. It is not an I do, we do, you do model. It's completely flipped. Okay, so by flipping that, what we're doing is, is we are challenging students to develop skills by challenging them at levels 
with rigor, and that's what rigor is, is challenge that exceeds skill. So by challenging students at levels that are slightly beyond their skills, we're creating a gap, an opportunity for growth, and that's a very dynamic place. And so that's what we want when we say defining what a classroom teaches is we're helping to define that classroom context for performance in, in, in a way that teachers can creatively push the skill level of students and others, push the level of challenge, create those gaps, and create the opportunity for growth. Okay, so there's a there's a lot of creativity there, and I and these are not mutually exclusive things. So, if you have questions about this, you know, again, it's a little different, I think, than um, the traditional model of resources and instruction um, that you'll see out there. So keep that all in mind, and and the idea that it's it's supportive uh, along the way, right? Thinking of this as a co continuum. So, let's transition to that next generation classroom experience here. So. Defining effective STEM instruction, um, thinking about skills, the skills that are expected of students, and really, uh, you know, students learning as scientists and engineers. So, what we're talking about in the next generation science standards and what cu what curriculum has to achieve in terms of by creating a path to mastery, a classroom level path to mastery that teachers can execute and that students can engage in and, and hope to engage in uh, has to meet the National Research Council's definition for effective STEM instruction. Here it is. It's moving from what you see on the left in that picture, which is an I do, you do, you know, model or an I do, we do, you do model to what you see on the right where students are tackling problems and questions that are not the, you know, the answers are not the result of direct instruction. They're actually something that are those two students' ideas being brought to life. Um, and they're in the role of scientists and engineers. So effective STEM instruction, science, technology, engineering, math, it capitalizes on students' early interests and experiences. It identifies and builds on what they know and provides them with the experiences to engage in the practice of science and sustain their interest. Quickly unpacking this, what it means is it's starting kindergarten, pre-K, and following children all the way along, intentionally nurturing them from one grade level to the next. That's what I mean by a system of curriculum. And it's intentionally scaffolding September through June, building, identifying and building on what children know, and providing them with the experiences on an everyday basis to engage in the skills. That's what these word practices means. That's a very intentional word. The skills specific to science and engineering, which are identified in these new standards. And that's that scope and sequence being rigorous is and, and student-centered, the way that I'm describing it here as being students bringing their ideas to life is what sustains student interest. Okay. So the idea that um, you know these just a high level look, the 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 skills specific to science and engineering are what you see here. This is not ours, but the next generation science standards uh, practices. These are what these are the skills that are expected of students. Uh, to be able to demonstrate in an, any novel context that's related but not the result of direct instruction. Okay, so students should be able to not only use models but develop them f on their own. Not only carry out investigations but plan them. Uh, not only collect data but actually argue from their analysis of that data using mathematical computational thinking and so on. One of the big shifts here is that oftentimes teachers will say, well, I do that. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not what I do as a teacher that matters as much as what students are able to demonstrate independently. What is the evidence of their learning when they're challenged with a context that is not the result of direct instruction? That's where the rubber meets the road. That's what shows what students master, whether they've mastered uh, the standards or not, and that's what curriculum needs to get. Uh, students to. Okay? The basis for your curriculum really needs to center around this fourth dimension, which is called the nature of science and engineering. You see, one of the issues with resources that are out there, whether they are claiming to be aligned or whether there's something that is in your closet that may have been inherited, you know, from three or four teachers ago, um, or parts of old kits, is that most adults most educated adults cannot tell you what science or engineering are. And that's a real problem because well-educated adults are also teachers, people like myself, people like yourself. 
uh, and if we can't say what science or engineering is definitively, how can we teach this with any level of clarity? And so the next generation science standards have given us a very clear definition of what science and engineering are, who scientists and engineers are, and how they're interrelated. And so science is knowledge from experimentation. Scientists ask questions and they answer those questions by planning and carrying out investigations. Engineers use their knowledge of science to identify and solve problems through prototyping. And the result of that is technology. Technology is anything that solves a human problem. And of course that technology enables scientists to ask deeper and answer new and deeper questions. Math is at the center of it all because it's a tool for communication. It helps us quantify our observations, analyze them, and actually use them as evidence to support claims and to actually structure experiments which are replicable and verifiable. And so math helps us not only communicate, but um, to move from subjective opinion to, ob to objective fact. That's why you see it in the center here. So any activity, any textbook thing, any worksheet, any hands-on investigation needs to pull these two things together, or really three things that we've talked about so far. It needs to, pull, it needs to, be, to reflect the nature of science and engineering in such a way that students are cognizant of that. It needs to be something that uh, brings the classroom alive in a way that students can actually engage as scientists and engineers in what you see on your screen now um, in this nature of science and engineering in three dimensions. That they're getting an opportunity to perform the expectation in the context of, by using skills and content and cross-cutting concepts together. Okay, and so uh, some, and that's why I said earlier, some resources may that you have may be able to do that or may be able to kind of be aligned to do that. Many of them uh, may not, and that's the result of this transition from a, tradi a traditional fact focus to a going to something beyond that, where we bring skill and fact together by challenging students to actually develop and use content with their skills, okay? Because that's what the nature of science and engineering is. And so what that looks like in the classroom, and the way that No Adam has designed curriculum um, and makes curriculum and materials from professional development available is to kind of view that classroom environment as starting with nonfiction reading to lay a foundation for Socratic dialogue where we can make concept to concept, concept to self, concept to world connections by challenging students to think about what they've read, think about their lives, think about where we live, and think about other things we've learned about to form those connections. And then what we do is, is we move from that dialogue uh, to think as a group about a context or a problem or scenario where we try to identify a problem or, or ask a question that we can then break into our student teams in order to plan investigations as lab partners and then carry out those investigations as scientists and engineers. So that's the thing, it's this 3-4 is really where students are in that role of scientist or engineer. And the focus all along here is that create, evaluate, analyze those higher order thinking skills. And then using the results of those experiments that we carry out to form evidence-based conclusions about our proposed answers to questions, those hypotheses that we were testing, or the prototypes that we proposed as solutions to the problems we identified. So that's claim evidence reasoning model, but it goes beyond that because you actually need to look at the question or problem you're identifying and the proposed solution as part of that, okay? So resources that you have may or may not fit into some part of the spectrum. And the thing is, is that this is true of every grade level. Now, you know, kindergarten, first grade, we may not be reading or reading at the level that we would in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, or eighth grade, twelfth grade, but there are analogous um, you know, read aloud, for instance, uh, you know, the way that we plan investigations, the level of sophistication and the type of investigations that we carry out uh, are different at these different grade levels, but the skills and the process that we're looking at here is very consistent over time. And that's why you see in classrooms like this, you know, fourth, fifth grade classroom, um, students in that role of scientist, or in this case, engineer, in their teams, looking at materials 
and bringing their ideas to life. Okay, that's how they're accessing the content with skills. And so however these two students decided to try and solve that problem, um, they're bringing that to life and that's how they're doing it here. It's this little crane to move those marbles. Okay, that's their idea. They've documented that in their plan. And they are now carrying out testing to gather data and they will form an evidence-based conclusion. I think these are fifth graders. Okay? And unfortunately, what you're seeing in these pictures often far exceeds the level of engagement that we even see at high school level with a lot of the traditional resources. Because again, um, in that traditional model, unfortunately, people have often created resources, which they oftentimes hold in high esteem, which circumvent challenge and circumvent, create a bridge over that gap between skill and challenge so that students don't actually develop the skill and they don't develop a mastery level ability to generalize what they've learned. And so that's what these students are doing here. You know, we don't just create plans, we don't just create physical prototypes and test them. You know, we use the result of that to take, to create ev data that we can analyze and use to support conclusions. And so that's what these two students are doing here. They're looking at what they've done and trying to come to some claim evidence reasoning model of conclusion about that. So we have lab notebooks beginning in fourth grade. Uh, prior to that, they have journals that are more uh, structured, uh, but really in fourth grade students are learning how to be scientists and engineers, you know, from scratch, um, not with that template structure. Of course, the role of curriculum is to help get students up to speed on that. How, how do you scaffold that in September through June and from one grade level to the next? The other piece is that that curriculum is integrating science, ELA, and math, focusing on that creative, evaluative, and analytical thinking skill, uh, which supports the Common Core technical ELA subject standards and also the Common Core math practices. Um, but it's in that context of a science class and Socratic dialogue and, of course, looking at how our different approaches are, um, are different. So, so and, and looking for human error and really considering thinking that out. Now, if you're going to move from supplements to comprehensive curriculum, key to all of this is the considering the four tiers of classroom resources. You see, at the low level, and under pre previous standards, a lot of people will find resources in their closet or even resources that claim to be next generation aligned but aren't, which are awareness ready resources. You get those from museums. You get those from companies, little downloadable one, two page lesson plans. Uh, you know, as a result of that, a student can tell you what a scientist is or an engineer is. They are aware of how earth science is applied to you know, building an oil rig or, um, you know, a day in the life of a geologist, okay? A student, as a result of engaging in that resource, is not prepared to be a geologist. They are not prepared to be scientists and engineers. Uh, they have not developed a skill as a result of that resource. And the knowledge that they've developed is very, very limited and very, very specific to a niche context. Now if you move beyond an awareness ready resource, you come to things like textbooks. Textbooks are the classic knowledge ready resource. They tell all about what a scientist has discovered, what engineers have developed to solve problems. They're very backward looking, historical in nature. They may have amazing pictures. They may be interactive. Okay, They may resemble a wiki. They may example, um, you know, videos and things like this. Those are knowledge ready resources. Moving beyond that, you get to things oftentimes like kits or parts of kits and little hands-on activities where students learn, you know, if you want to be like a geologist and find out how hard a rock or mineral is, you can scratch it. And you can scratch it on different surfaces and you can find out how hard that rock or mineral is in relation to these different surfaces and you can come up with an, a hardness level for that. So you learn to perform tasks. Okay, that's what performance ready resources are all about. Take the sheet, take this little make by number, take this picture, take what I've shown you, take what I've done in front of you and do it again for yourself so you can see and you can experience how to perform that task. Mastery readiness 
is what we're really looking for. That's what the new, the new standards really expect. Mastery readiness expects students to develop skills which they can generalize. And uh, creative, evaluative, and analytical thinking skills to be able to develop and use content in general in a way that they can look at a novel context and be able to apply those skills and to be able to analyze and evaluate and create their own conclusion from what they've seen and defend it. Okay? And so that means developing and using their knowledge. Okay? It, and, and being able to analyze the tasks that others have done. And so in the classroom, the classroom needs to create an environment where students are challenged at that level. And that's the role of mastery ready resources, uh, curriculum resources. Okay? So, so curriculum involves you know, grade specific units. It involves uh, lessons as part of those units. It involves professional development for teachers to understand what's involved in that curriculum, um, how those lessons pedagogically are, are supposed to be executed with a full release of responsibility, and how the materials uh, come together uh, to, to, to um, provide an opportunity for students to engage the phenomenon hands-on. So all of this, you know, curriculum, professional development, and materials support the STEM learning environment in a rigorous way. Okay, and so what I'm showing you pictures of here are from No Adams curriculum and materials and professional development and learning environments. But you know, if you have resources and you're, you know, some of it's you know materials and some of it's curriculum, some of it's you know professional development videos. You know, you have to knit it together, kind of hand in glove, to be able to have a nurturing STEM learning environment that pushes students appropriately September through June and from one grade level to the next and not just in one classroom but across all the classrooms in a district so that you know the different buildings are supporting each other. Um, if you're in an urban environment with English language learners, you need students uh, who are newcomers to be able to connect up with their peers. Uh, and if you have students who've always been here, born here, um, but for some reason you know their parents are moving from one part of town to the other on a consistent basis and they end up in a different school that when they go from one fifth grade classroom to another in the same district that they're not getting a different definition of science or a different um, you know uh, take on earth or space science such that they're now confused or that they're only doing earth and space science all year long and not getting exposure to other areas of the curriculum Okay, so five key things to look for when you're analyzing alignment between just the basics of the resources that you have as parts and pieces perhaps now is asking yourself, you know, is there a clearly connected purpose between all these resources? Can I show a continuum uh, that's scaffolding and that's intentionally nurturing students September through June through the resources I have available. And what you see on the screen is, you know, second grade level resources and fourth grade level resources. There should be a very clear difference and purpose. Okay? And students should be in the position of asking questions and solving problems on an everyday basis and then engage in a process to advance from the question of problem to an evidence-based conclusion. The other thing is, is how is there a 90% plus reliance on the students themselves. Where is there a full release of responsibility? You should be getting to a full release of responsibility within 10 weeks um, of the school year. Okay, and so that's how you know you get to that full release of responsibility at the skills and, and then coaching students really fully um, is what the teacher's role is. So group think transitioning into um, that student-centered instruction. So if your resources aren't built for reliance on students, it relies on teachers, then those are probably resources that either should be fully phased out by the 10th or say absolute worst 15th week of school, or uh, they just don't have a place anymore under these new standards. Third piece to look for is engagement in three dimensions. How are the students being engaged in the concept, the skills, and the relationships between content simultaneously? This is again regardless of grade level. Okay, if a resource doesn't do that, it doesn't have a home in these new standards. Fourth, it, how is the resources that you're pulling together part of a year-long conversation? If they don't belong as part of your year-long conversation, 
they should disappear because unit order, lesson order matters, concept order matters, and that's how we help children evolve their thinking. And that's how the context of science and engineering and the nature of science and engineering come alive. Okay? It's part of this evolving context in the classroom. Last, number five things that you want to be looking for as part of that, um, or creating, is grouping the standards together so that the concepts and, the, and also concepts, so the standards and concepts are not occurring in isolation. So what I talked about in that continuum, this, you know, is a week of science. Okay, um, this is a lesson. A lesson is not a single day. At the same time, a lesson is not covering one standard. A, a standard doesn't happen in only one unit or only one grade level. So keep that in mind. Okay, we're not checking off standards. Standards are living, breathing expectations. Okay, so as you think about the resources you have, what you really want to do is um, you have to take a survey, okay? So part of that survey is really either for yourself or hopefully with your team convening a team or finding a way to round out your skill set here uh, to envision, first of all, if you're doing this for somebody else, considering how your team's organizational behavior is, you know? Um, if people are prone to misinterpretation, um, then having exceptional written and oral communication skills is going to be very important because the result of your curriculum alignment, realignment, or development process is going to be have, have to be something that fits with the organizational behavior of everybody in your team, not just something for yourself. You have to be able, as part of your team or your, yourself, to envision the student and the teacher's experience simultaneously. So looking across all of these different pieces, if that's what you have, and you're going to try and make it into something comprehensive, how are you going to knit those together into a cohesive, comprehensive student and teacher experience that fits uh, hand and glove um, on both sides and then is nurturing? Uh, and if you're not doing that, you're going to go to an outside resource that's going to claim to be aligned. That's something that that curriculum company should have done for you. Okay? And so that's what. Um, needs to be related here. The next piece is to consider how those disciplinary core ideas um, are nuanced, so you have to have a nuanced understanding of that. Consider how they interrelate and how they are connected through the cross-cutting concepts that's the systems behavior side of this, okay? And have processes in place uh, to be able to develop and use the three dimensions. Now the processes are the scientific process and the engineering design process, okay? Um, and you know that should be obvious in the curriculum as part of how the performance expectations are networked together, how they horizontally and vertically articulate and form units. Okay? At that point, once you have networked the expectations and you have this horizontal and vertical articulation of those expectations, that's when you can begin to form units. So this idea that you know earth and space science can happen anywhere, that you have three units a year and, you know, a kit is as good for third grade as it is for fifth grade is just, it's um, not true. You can't create a unit and then try and take all of these foundational things into account afterward. And that's why, unfortunately, trying to move from bits and pieces into something comprehensive is, uh, is in essence, reinventing the wheel because um, you're trying to cause a fish to fly. So unless you had a flying fish to start with, uh, it's, a, it's an arduous process. Um, and unfortunately, that's why a lot of these resources that are out there, you can go to the NSTA bookstore. That's my, one of my favorite places to find things that are really <laughs> good examples of what not to do. Because what, what's happening is, is people are taking the former resources and standards and trying to kind of you know, say, well, this is a disciplinary core idea. This is a cross-cutting concept. And, and sort of point here and there and say, well, this is where it is. Uh, but that's not how it works. That's not the spirit of the standards, and that's not the nature of science and engineering. And so you have to be very aware of that uh, when you look at these resources, that an old unit is not quick and easy to kind of turn around and make um, to fit this next-generation model of inquiry instruction. So 
I'll, you know, use the example, uh, you know, of of what No Adam has done here. You know, it's important in the place where you're most likely to succeed is where you have had uh, unit specific, grade level specific units and and or, uh, unit sequencing. And so this is No Adam's grade level structure and unit sequencing. Uh, we start in kindergarten now, actually. Um, that's going to be available uh, in 2017, uh, for 2017 uh, for the public, but uh, it's been made available to some select folks this year um, as part of our, a pilot program. But it starts at kindergarten and moves all the way up, in our case, through eighth grade. But you can see how earth and space and life science and physical science and engineering, uh, applications of engineering and technology are part of this interspersed as well. Um, how it's happening every single year, and it's intentionally building from one unit to the next and scaffolding up September to June and grade level to grade level, all the way up through middle school. So moving something from one grade level to the next uh, is, a, is a tricky process. Um, and the way that we were able to be aligned so quickly uh, with lessons and content and materials in order to have this full curriculum was that we had been developing this alongside the release of all of the next generation documentation simply because it was an, a very effective way to engage students, uh, produced very high uh, student learning outcomes on existing uh, state level testing. And um, it was frankly just great teaching and learning. I mean, it was re great research based methodologies for teaching and learning. And by virtue of doing that for years, like I said, you know, we've been in our 10th year now, doing that year after year, um, implementing it, gathering uh, not only our own team observations from thousands of students and you know, hundreds and hundreds of different classrooms, we were able to create a continuous feedback loop that allowed us to constantly uh, get closer and closer to the expectations of the standards in a way that, you know, not only are these teacher developed, but they're, they're classroom informed uh, lessons and units. And so uh, that's how we were able to get where we are and leapfrog the process. So not a lot of organizations did that. Um, what a lot of curriculum companies decided to do was to basically wait till the final standards were published, which, uh, you know, they didn't want to really take into account the draft standards and, and, and begin iterating early. Um, so that they could get the most out of the products they had from a revenue perspective. Um, and so they made a last minute move to, you know, try and point out <laughs> sort of like, oh, you know, well, this is what this is and this is what that is, but not to really revamp things from the ground up. Um, so they, they probably have 10 years to go to get to where we are, if I had to guess at this point. Um, maybe they can two-step that and get there in eight years. but um, let me show you what a next generation aligned STEM task and curriculum looks like. I'll take, I'll, I'll kind of go soup to nuts here quickly through it from a teacher's guide perspective and from a student's reading perspective, from a student's guide perspective. So you can see perhaps areas where the bits and pieces that you have may fit. So of course, starting at that scope and sequence, right? And making sure that a standard is not once and done, but it's part of a continuous conversation September through June or August to May and grade level to grade level and that we're bringing together an experience that takes students across uh, nonfiction reading all the way to their own evidence that they use to support their own claims about their own ideas to problems and questions, okay, which is what you see here. So the path to mastery is not 100% through literacy, but we use literacy as a means to access the concepts and the ideas that we then build on, we discuss in an auditory sense, and that we plan, uh, and then we carry out in a kinesthetic sense, and so on. That we take into account classroom management, we help support the best practices of teaching and learning, um, whether teachers are brand new educators or seasoned uh, professionals, um, to be able to create an inquiry environment. Um, at the level of materials management, but also classroom management when it comes to Socratic dialogue so that we can build on what we've read uh, to make those personal connections together as a group and discussion and get into planning the investigation. So we support that in our teacher's uh, guides. And you can download an example of this, so you can go there right now, uh, noadam.com forward slash curriculum. 
and you can actually access for every grade level um, an example of a, our, our first unit, which is only a month's worth of content. We have nine units per grade level, uh, with the exception of kindergarten. Kindergarten units are larger, um, and we only have three uh, in kindergarten. But you can download an example, and you can see exactly what I'm showing you. I'm going to pull an example from fourth grade. You can see down the corner it says fourth grade. And this is looking at NGSS standards. Um, we also have, for adaptive states, uh, our NGSS curriculum aligns to all the adoption states as well as California. And um, uh, we have a Massachusetts-specific version uh, because Massachusetts is an adaptive state uh, like West Virginia. So you see here lesson progression. So here we have three different lessons and a unit overview and unit goals for that teacher. So they understand at a high level what are the mastery objectives of this unit. And I'm just taking screenshots at this point, so we're going to skip over a lot of different pages. The next thing that we see are the grade-specific standards. Depending on what state you're in, um, NGSS has grade-specific standards at the elementary level and then transitions into grade spans. But in certain states, there have been um, decisions made around the middle school level and so on where there should be grade specific standards. So we've taken all of that into account. Key point here is that just because a standard is grade specific, when you read the documentation, it is for mastery by the end of that grade. So it is not grade specific in the sense that that is the only grade that that standard should show up in. So what we do here is, is we make sure that the standards are in the unit, and actually they often occur in multiple units, um, for mastery but they are also supported by standards from prior grade levels and future grade levels so that those standards are from prior grade levels are reinforced and standards from future grade levels are introduced in connection with the grade specific standards. So this is a mechanism for mastery. Okay, and so we unpack that for the teachers here in those units right off the bat. They understand how that uh, disciplinary core idea dimension, which is why this is an orange, and the cross-cutting concept dimension is occurring in different lessons related to the performance expectation. And then we go further uh, to unpack the skills dimension by lesson, which is why you see it here, science and engineering practices in blue, and how students are actually engaging in that by lesson as well, that dimension. We help the teachers understand how to plan and pace the units. And we show if they're using a three-day week or a four-day week or a you know, two-day week visuals on how that lesson can be parsed over the week. We then support that educator in creating this next generation inquiry environment by making sure that they have unit-specific, grade-specific vocabulary. And this is not only technically accurate vocabulary, but it's vocabulary that is relevant and central to what the students are going to be reading about, talking about, and planning and carrying out um, as part of being scientists or engineers. And it's a living vocabulary because it's going to become part of the next units and lessons as well. So this matches exactly what's in the student's reading material. Next, what we do is we build content professional development into each unit so that the teachers can see all of those vocab words, those concepts used in context at an adult level. And what's really important about that is that you know, whether you are quote unquote a content specialist at the middle school or high school level, or whether you are an elementary quote unquote generalist at, you know, the first, second, kindergarten level, we want to make sure that teachers as adults have read about this material at an adult level, um, not in such a way that it's overwhelming technical detail, but in such a way that they are well equipped to think about and discuss with students in a Socratic dialogue these vocabulary words, these ideas, um, and connect them to other concepts and to the world around the students and to, um, uh, to what's at hand, to what's part of these investigations. Okay, so that's part of content professional development that's built in there. Key support is not everybody, that's the thing I think everyone takes for granted, is that whether you're a content specialist or a generalist, whatever, nobody's an expert in everything. Okay, and the thing is, is that nobody's really an expert at the end of the day because these disciplines go very, very deep. So what we need to do is help people access them um, at a level that's appropriate as adults uh, to be able to support next generation inquiry in the classroom. The next piece that we get to is the lesson itself. So we outline the objective. These are the materials that we provide as consumables and non-consumables, teacher preparation notes, 
we help the teachers understand how to um, set up um, stations so that those materials can be picked up by students once they are have their investigations planned and they can go back and carry out those investigations. Prep notes for the teacher. Now, because we provide the materials, you know, the prep is much different than you might be on your, your own program. It's not sending notes no home for bottles or cutting things up. It's really making sure that we have access to the electronic visuals and so on, that we're ready to go. Socratic dialogue, we support folks uh, to be able to have that Socratic dialogue after the reading. Um, there's a video which you are welcome to access, whether or not you're a NoAdam user, uh, by going to noadam.com forward slash Socratic. We give an hour webinar on how to have next generation Socratic dialogue with your class. But what that's focused on is unpacking the big ideas of a lesson, which is part of a unit. And so what we do in our teacher components here is you can see that we're unpacking the, the big ideas that were in the reading and helping the teacher by scaffolding different questions uh, that they want to ask, uh, areas that they want to probe into to unpack those big ideas with their students so that they can transition into a lab. And again, this is fourth grade level. So helping then transition the group to thinking about a question, which they break into groups to then attack or tackle through the scientific method, the scientific process, some people may call it, or the engineering design process if it's a problem scenario that they're trying to solve. And we support that by giving the teacher everything they need if they had to fully guide, but that's not the purpose of this level of detail. The purpose of this level of detail is to help the teacher be well equipped to coach children along the way in their small teams. So we have checkpoints that help teachers to, che to check for understanding, check for um, where students should be in this process, the expect if, if the student teams are meeting the expectations of the process, and then releasing that responsibility so that they can go on to a next checkpoint and so along the way. Okay, so all of this is built in. This is part of supporting teachers in actually delivering effective STEM instruction. That's the point. Having an exemplar so the teacher can see what a student's lab notebook would look like. Of course, this is a clean example because obviously this is something that's a messy learning process. So there's lots of corrections and changes. Another piece of this is helping teachers understand how to assess. Okay, so what that means is, is providing teachers with vocabulary checks. Okay, which can be used as homework or tickets to leave or um, uh, also concept checks which can be used to help students transition from a model of expectations built around direct instruction to a model of expectations that are built on inquiry and real next generation inquiry. So that's what you see here in concept checks. Now could be multiple choice but also open response. You see what we're helping students do is make the switch to in, to performance-based assessment. So by providing those scenarios, which we then tease out the three dimensions in the performance expectation by asking a series of questions related to that scenario and challenging students' own ideas and contributions around it so that we can see, can they really generalize and synthesize with what they've learned? In order to support teachers in, in grading these different pieces, so, you know, of course, there's lab notebooks that are able to be graded, so we provide all the rubrics. Um, there are the concept checks, the reading comprehension questions, um, the vocabulary uh, checks, and so on. We provide comprehensive answer keys that explain why it's the answer and why it's not the other answers, um, and even right down to data and so on. Now, if you, one of the luxuries by having a comprehensive you know, system like what we've developed and what um, many districts across the United States and even internationally have implemented, um, you know, is not just a system of instruction and of curriculum and resources and professional development, but it's actually something that connects up with Common Core Math and Common Core ELA because of the design of the new standards so that teachers can be teaching more effectively across the curriculum leveraging those Common Core math practices if you're a Common Core math state and connecting up with the skills of the, and um, application of reading informational text, Common Core uh, writing standards, Common Core language and speaking and listening standards from Common Core English language arts. Okay, so that's what you see here documented for folks. 
help folks visualize the concepts and how they connect. And so, you know, um, and even differentiating instruction sort of the supports for that. So you can see that is what goes into mas our mastery ready resource. So if you are trying to take what you have and create a mastery ready resource, those are not every part, but a lot of the parts, um, which again you can see you can go for free and download uh, an example of any grade level curriculum at noadam.com forward slash curriculum um, or STEM. And, and you can see um, all of the parts there. Uh, but you can have to take what you have and, f and, and form it into that um, in a way that nurtures students September through June and from one grade level to the next. Now, where you work with leading districts, not so much that folks, you know, have the best data in the world when they come to us, um, but they want to transform their students' thinking and really focus on developing higher order thinking by placing children in the role of scientist and engineer and nurturing that um, over time. That's what I mean by leading. Um, it's really leaders who are the ones focused on making that happen um, because it's not all about test data. Um, as a result of making, you know, implementing curriculum like that, we, we tend to have our clients in the top 25% of schools and districts in their state. We have many um, schools and districts that are in the top five uh, in their state. We, in Massachusetts, by example, um, we've had the number one elementary school, the number one school district uh, for science performance and, and so on and so forth um, for years now. And the reason is, is that you get great data by developing great thinking. And you do that by developing a great inquiry environment that challenges students and releases responsibility and supports them in a way that goes beyond just answering uh, a memorization type question. So, so, you know, so we're happy to work with you. Um, you know, we have these uh, materials available. Um, unfortunately, you know, you have one example online that's free. <laughs> you can take a look at. Um, they are a purchased uh, resource. So, you know, if you're, we don't sell it to teachers directly. Um, but if a school or district is thinking about making that switch and and really focusing on higher order thinking and, and making a transformation like this, um, you know, we'd love to talk with you. But if you're looking to other resources as well, I just want to point out that it's not as simple as a textbook. It's not as simple as an activity sheet or, you know, um, a nifty set of materials that you can connect together and it beeps or blinks or you can code it. Um, it it's really much more nuanced. In some ways it can be more basic, but it's really important uh, to think about the purpose of what you have and is the purpose mastery. Now I mentioned about from a student's perspective. Obviously the students are engaged in uh, working in small groups with partners. They are uh, tackling a problem or question. They have resources available. They're working as scientists. They're working as engineers. Um, that's the 90% the, the of what's happening. The 10% that leads it off with that nonfiction reading, I'll just show you kind of the, some of the features and how that links up with um, the other uh, teacher's components. So broken into sections by lesson, you have a, a reading piece that's at anchoring the vocabulary and the concepts in real life context. And so um, what you see here is not a paragraph explaining a word, but what you see here is a page that's scaffolding with the next page, that's scaffolding with the next page, that's bringing the concept, the vocabulary word of science, to life. And in the back of that reader, obviously, we have vocabulary lists that say, you know, what is science or what is engineering, what is volume, um, and defining it. Okay, so you get that definition. But the piece is, is that we are giving purpose to the word and purpose to the concept by anchoring it in reality. And then, of course, having text features and reading comprehension questions and things like that. But this content is the student's level of what you would have seen at the adult level in the teacher background. This vocab list is exactly the vocab list that you would see at that, um, in that teacher's component. So all of this comes together to support students um, developing skills and, uh, and using those skills to develop and use 
the content of the standards so that students are prepared to answer any question or solve any problem um, using what they know and ex developing it and extending it so that they are not living with the expectation and relying upon direct instruction um, when they enter the workplace um, because that's a key factor here that we want students who are college and career ready. So it's not just about claim evidence reasoning but it's being able to start with a question, uh, form a hypothesis, support that hypothesis with a claim uh, or make a claim about it, support it with evidence and reason it in writing and so this is what students are learning to do. Okay, so with that said, I will grab questions. We are um, at that uh, one hour mark. Uh, I'm happy to take some questions if they haven't been answered yet. Um, I also will I would promise to uh, introduce you to some other resources that we have available and that we're making available that are not all the, only our resources but the you know sh shareware for for lack of a better term. I would point you to um, while those questions are coming in. EQIP rubrics. Um, the latest uh, EQIP rubric was recently released. It's uh, version 3.0. You can access that. We have a, a redirect link available for you, noadam.com forward slash EQIP. That's a good resource for looking at whether or not your existing lessons and units are aligned. You'll see it's, it's, this is how we align ourselves uh, and our lessons and units. So what you see there is what we align to, um, but it's also the authority on what is aligned. Uh, versus what is not at the unit and lesson level. At the higher level, because units have to fit together as part of a continuum of curriculum, grade, you know, September to June and grade level to grade level, you should use the peak alignment criteria for that. And I forget exactly what that stands for, um, but that's available at noadam.com, and that's another resource that was developed by Achieve in conjunction with um, Next Generation Aligned Resources that says what a Next Generation Aligned Resource is. If you'd like to get those curriculum samples that I mentioned, you can go to noadam.com forward slash curriculum, or you can just go to our website, navigate to the top, check STEM curriculum, and scroll down, you'll see the different grade level boxes. I hope this has been helpful. I um, hope maybe you've learned something or thought a little differently about something. If you'd like to stay in touch, you can follow us for free, subscribe to our blog for free, noadam.com forward slash blog. There's a bunch of resources under the resource section, other webinars, ebooks at noadam.com um, forward slash resources, or you can just go to that section of our site. Follow us at Facebook. Um, great way to learn about these, these uh, events and also on Twitter. If you have any questions and you like to, you're in a curriculum process and you know this is a kind of resource that um, would meet your needs, that you are really focused on trying to be a growth mindset district, that you are thinking about um, engaging students in challenge and helping them develop skills as part of uh, meeting the needs of these new standards, I'd uh, invite you to reach out. Um, Karen is great. You can reach her by phone 617-475-3475, extension 2010, or by email at kpeak, and that's P-E-A-K-E uh, at noadam.com. To, uh, so that's the K, K, P, A, K, E at noadam.com uh, if you have any questions. She can help connect you with resources and other samples as well. So that said, um, I'm going to skip all the data slides for now. I can come back to them if there's questions about that um, as I take a look at these questions. Okay, so some folks here have asked about a copy of the webinar itself. Um, so, the, everybody will get a copy of the webinar um, link, and that will be mailed, emailed out to you within the next 48 hours if you're on the live session. Um, somebody asked about, there's, you know, since there's not truly one scientific method and that that's not a specific term that's referred to in NGSS, why is that a part of lessons? Um, and also the term hypothesis is not used, um, and so, you know, that perhaps the idea of a prediction is more appropriate or so on. So here's the thing. Um, science, so the, there's a gap in these new standards, uh, and the gap is between practices and how you actually 
how those practices are applied. So that's where the um, next generation science standards have left off. You see, they haven't gone as far as to say how the practices are applied to answering questions and solving problems. But the thing is, is that we have a body of research um, and we just have the reality of how STEM industry um, approaches problems and questions. Um, universal um, design, engineering design process, and you're right, I would say that there is not a, a uh, single scientific process, there is not a single engineering design process. However, there is process which is appropriate to K-12 for both science and engineering. And so uh, it behooves educators to think two or th you know, three degrees beyond just trying to teach an isolated skill to help students engage as scientists and engineers by helping students understand how you progress from a question to an evidence-based conclusion or how you progress from a, identifying a problem to an evidence-based solution. And the way that you do that is has a process to it. And we can have a debate about what that exact process is. No Adam has de developed over the course of 10 years uh, a scientific process that uh, mirrors what the international science fair standards um, and the national academies and the National Institutes of Health and so on have all uh, sort of commented and vetted on um, you know what process and expectations are for how you go from a question to an evidence-based conclusion or from a problem to an evidence-based solution. Um, but you're absolutely right. There is not one. Uh, and it's not to say, and I think this is where people have trouble, is that there is not, you know, science and engineering are non-linear. And people who are kind of your beer and pretzels armchair experts, um, as soon as they hear process will say, well, that, you know, that's that's junk because science and engineering are not linear. Well, guess what? Process is not linear either. Um, however, teaching children um, the basic uh, logical framework, and that's the thing, is that a process is a framework for progressing from a problem or question to an evidence-based uh, solution. Uh, teaching that to students is, is very, very helpful and equips them and gives context and a framework for being able to apply the science and engineering practices and pursue the disciplinary core ideas in context. Um, so I won't go into it a whole lot more than that because it's, it's, I think it's a very key point. Um, but you talk about a hypothesis. is A hypothesis is not a prediction. A hypothesis is a hypothetical answer to the question that you're pursuing. So. In essence, you might say, well, that's the same thing as a prediction, but oftentimes educators are erroneously teaching students to frame things as, I predict that X, Y, Z because X, Y, you know, A, B, C. Well, guess what? Um, that's a, something that students are going to have to unlearn when they get to college because uh, you cannot actually test, uh, you know, what you think, I think, is not a testable statement. Um, so, you know, that'll, you know, bio 101 or chemistry 101 or physics 101 is going to be eliminating that, uh, an unlearning session for that student. The other thing about this is that, um, you know, from a, um, the, that idea that you are testing a hypothetical answer or a hypothetical solution. Um, through either the scientific process or engineering design process. Um, that is how you take a prediction, which is something internal, and you actually manifest it uh, as something that's testable as a scientist or an engineer. And so that's a key difference between a proposed prototype and a, hypo a hypothesis. I think, unfortunately, the word hypothesis just gets a bad rap because of um, what everybody's you know high school science experiment was or experience was uh, when they were in school as, you know, copying something down and bow ties and lab coats and all of that sort of thing. Um, if you'd like a copy of the slides, you can reach out about that. We'll do our best to get that to you, but it'll be a recording that's available. 
another person has asked a question regarding special ed students and ELLs. Uh, and I'll see if I can pull a couple of these uh, questions together. So for folks that may be at the high school level or even the elementary level, um, if you are fe facing an environment where you have a bunch of students who are English language learners, ELLs, ELLs, whatever acronym you want to use there, um, or students and or students who are special education students, um, if you, in either case, you know, a student who is an English language learner is a student with intellectual ability. They just happen to speak a different language. And they are somewhere on a gradient between their language in, in one form and English language, perhaps. Okay. So a key factor here is that we take concepts and skills and we get them off of the page. We get them out of a textbook. Um, if your path to mastery is an English language textbook, then your English language learners are going to gravely struggle. Okay? What we need to do is we need to take um, English language text, which is nonfiction, and we need to provide that to English language learners um, as part of uh, their English language program. But what we need to do is we need to provide a path through discussion because English language learners are uh, verbal first. Um, so through discussion like Socratic dialogue, so that those ideas that we don't get through reading, we get through discussion. And those ideas that we don't get through discussion, we can actually see for ourselves hands-on by actually uh, creating plans and carrying out those plans. Um, and in a, in a substantially separate environment, you may be creating a plan as a small group of 10 students, um, which is what many substantially separate um, SEI type classrooms would be. Now, if you have students who are mainstreamed, they are mainstreamed because the belief is that they can function in a mainstream class environment as English language learners um, in science. So they should be able to be paired with English speaking students and be able to contribute to that pair um, verbally, if not uh, through writing. And so you kind of scaffold it that way. What's very important here is that language acquisition for those English language learners um, is heightened by the fact that students are going to be seeing things um, and doing things which they do not often have a word in their own native language to describe. And so what they see visually uh, becomes an anchor or what they, you know, kinesthetically and, and auditory um, you know, experience of this phenomenon becomes a tool for anchoring and acquiring new English language words. Okay. And that's, that's a key factor. Um, if you have a student who should be in a substantially separate classroom who can't speak a lick of English um, and has been mainstreamed, then that's actually a district or school level problem with identifying that student and providing that student with adequate services. Um, but in most cases, um, you know, this is how it plays out. Now, special education students, let's go back to this uh, same kind of core concept. A student who is a special education student is not a student without intellectual ability. Okay? A student may be intellectually impaired. Now, if a student is intellectually impaired, they're on an IEP and there are specific uh, accommodations that are made. And some of that may mean that while they're physically a fifth grade student, they may be operating at a first or second grade level, in which case operating on first or second grade curriculum is appropriate. Okay. Now, if you have a student who is a special education student, but they're on an IEP, they're at grade level and should be at grade level in science, but they have a language-based learning disability. For instance, they're dyslexic or um, they have fine motor skill issues or they have Asperger's or something like that. The, the role of special education is not to remove the opportunity for growth. The role of special education in, in IEPs, individualized education plans or you know whatever flavor of um, acronym your state uses, 
Um, the role of an IEP is to identify and remove the barriers to intellectually engaging in content at grade level. Okay, it doesn't mean making templates and fill in the blanks. It means if a student cannot write something in a blank composition notebook, that you give them access to write that in a Google Doc on a tablet or on a laptop or on a PC in your in your classroom. Okay, um, that you give them extra time, perhaps, um, to discuss things. That they may have a scribe in the classroom as part of that IEP. It doesn't mean dumbing things down. Um, so if that, you know, so you're, if you ask about how to get uh, special educators on board, um, I guess, you know, the, 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 the piece of this is, is how are, how, you know, how are you creating an opportunity um, for your special education students such that they can acquire the necessary skills? and perform the expectations and, and provide evidence of their learning um, as every other student would. And the thing is, is that if the tools and resources, the quote unquote tools and resources that are being developed and, and the way that instruction is being delivered in the special education classes is circumventing that opportunity, creating a bridge, you know, so that the level of skill required is below the level of skill that a student has or should be expected at grade level then that's a problem, it's a problem. Um, and it's, it's a discussion that needs to be had and, and people need to come together um, to look at the IEPs and see what is this IEP really asking and what is the accommodation that we are making um, so that we don't dumb this down. Uh, last question here, let's see here. Um, Anybody who has sent over an email address asking for slides, unfortunately, I'm uh, not able to collect all those email addresses through this mechanism. So if you would, uh, you can reach out to one of the email addresses on the screen uh, right now, and uh, you know we'll do our best to get those to you. Or you can go to the Contact Us section of our website, and we can do it that way. Uh, folks asking about, uh, do we have resources for grades 9 through 12? Unfortunately, we do not have curriculum and materials for 9 through 12. Uh, we do have ebooks, webinars, and a bunch of other resources under the resources section that would be applicable to understanding how to interpret and implement the Next Generation Science Standards for grades 9 through 12. But we don't have anything um, in terms of curriculum where, you know, you could spin around and, um, you know, implement that uh, in September. However, um, and I and, and this is <laughs> this is you know I, it would be you being an angel uh, for your peers and perhaps helping yourself along the way too is that you know middle school prepares children for high school and elementary school prepares students for middle school and so on and this is very much a system of standards when we think about next generation science standards um, it behooves you to help those below you to implement next generation aligned inquiry, next generation inquiry resources uh, to prepare those students for your high school classes. Because frankly, um, the skills, the process knowledge, uh, the content knowledge is all things that students either will or will not bring to the high school classroom when they get there. And the research shows us that students entering middle school are already eliminating uh, STEM as an interest, as a career choice, and it's also where we see across the country uh, standardized test grades tank. And the bottom line is that it has to do with the method of instruction and the um, lack of um, really <laughs> putting students into this role and challenging them appropriately uh, that I would argue contributes to that. And so you know, if you can help your peers to, to do their job at the lower levels, it's going to support you in doing your job, and it's going to give you a set of students who are much more capable and ready and interested to learn uh, what, you're, what you're asking them to engage in at the high school level. And, you know, perhaps at some point we get there, but at this point we aren't. So with that said, um, I uh, will sign off here in one second.
some folks are asking about specific programs like STC and FOSS um, and EIE and others and how challenging it is to ad uh, adapt them to the new NGSS standards. And I would say that um, it's, I think it's really challenging because and I think that even what they're selling, those companies and organizations are selling now, you're giving away whatever, as NGSS Aligned really isn't. And the reason is, is that they are these little disparate modules with um, kind of a, some hands-on materials and a whole bunch of essentially activity sheets that then, you know, this is other Activate Science and all these other things, you know, basically, you know, workbooks with questions pre-inserted and, you know, and so on. Um, you know, it, 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 the bottom line is, is what, what is the instructional philosophy of your school district and your building? And how is it that that resource of rocks and minerals literally in a box, of batteries and wires in a box, and a bunch of things that you can Xerox, how is that really part of placing children into the role of scientists and engineers? challenging them to apply those science and engineering practices and hopefully, and I would argue the way that we do, you know, engaging them in the process of science and the process of engineering um, appropriately and in a scaffolding manner. Uh, that's, a, that's a tall task uh, from, to, 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 ac to accomplish that with, with a product that a, that a company says you can kind of do anywhere between three and five. Uh, you could do it any time you want, September or June. You can do some part of it or no part of it. You know, it's, a, it's, it's nonsensical. A third grader is very different than a fifth grader. Um, and so that, th there's a lot to wade through. So, you know, uh, I'll leave it there. And again, thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you for um, caring, really, about these new standards and focusing on um, you know, how you can better meet your students' needs. Um, I'm Francis Vigent. That'll conclude our webinar for today. If you have any further questions, please reach out, and uh, we'd love to speak with you. Take care. Bye-bye.